so we can live with dignity. We don't have to live in a property where we hit our head um, um, on the roof when we get up. <laughs> Mr. Wu Wei, I would like to give my views on part three amendments of uh, Mr. James Toe. Now, Mr. James Toe pointed out that um, the, the part three amendment is to do with the uh, schedule one uh, part one C of the bill. That is for all instruments and uh, for all the both the buyers and sellers of the, um, to, uh, who are parties to the instruments, they must all be held uh, legally liable. This is ex the concept of executor, uh, ex uh, those who are in the execution, well, maybe it, it is the way the law is written. And maybe it will then cover all parties involved. Maybe that's the concept. But if I may um, refer members to the administration's explanation, Ms. Poole explain. Now you have to explain why other parties have to be covered. They are included here. But if they don't have any liability, then, then maybe people will be more assured. Uh, because uh, the government's explanation uh, does not put minds at ease. Now for part one, all uh, parties uh, to the instruments or those who uh, execute the deeds. Uh, here we talk about a real estate agents or uh, usually, generally speaking, real estate agents in the uh, signing of uh, provisional sales and purchase agreements, the agents will not be held liable. But w what do you mean by generally speaking? Now, will there be uh, instances when um, estate agents will have to be held liable um, in at the stage of signing provisional sales and purchase agreement? So shouldn't the government be accurate and detailed in its response um, and uh, convince the people. But no, it seems the government hasn't done so, and I think that is the real problem. Because the whole explanation doesn't put minds at ease. In instead, the uh, explanation is unsettling. Now, the uh, ad valorem duty we're talking about is 15%. And we could be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars given the current uh, property price level. It could even be more than a million dollars, so it's not a small sum at all. It's not the case compared to, say, um, securities um, duty or levy, stamp duty. So if uh, there is some um, litigation, People could rely on the instrument as a defense if uh, there's a government explanation, that is, and then people will feel safer. Shouldn't how legislation be enacted? Um, you shouldn't say that uh, if there's a problem, uh, generally speaking, it would be a defense. If it's just generally speaking, that means there could be many loopholes in the legislation. Because we're just talking about generally speaking. Well, because generally speaking, I can give you, I can make you a senior official even. So this is the first important point that needs to be explained clearly in your reply in a moment, Secretary. So it would form part of the records. Second question. In this case, if we take out um, the, the concept of other signatories, would it uh, give out a wrong message? Would it affect the market? Now, of course, both uh, the buyers and sellers have to pay stamp duties, and that won't set out a wrong message to the market. But would there be other impact? Could it be the case, then, that uh, there will be a bubble in the Market? No. And it's not uh, the case that uh, if this is done, then the message will be less harsh. No. And the government won't uh, lose out on revenue either. 
Now, in your opening remarks, Secretary, you mentioned that for the third group of amendments by Mr. James Toll, the government's against it. Now, for the first and second group, you have at least explained why. And you said uh, um, because there could be problems uh, with um, sending out um, confusing messages, so you agree. But for the third group, you just say the government doesn't agree to the third group of amendments, to, but you don't explain why. If, why didn't you? Because if you had explained it, then people would, um, um, you know, f be more assured. And you're saying that for all parties outside of the buyers and sellers, under certain circumstances, um, the uh, relevant instruments may have to be produced um, for, to pursue any de default in um, agency fees. I don't know if that's your thinking. Then you have to make it clear that it's not uh, the view of Mr. James Toe, it's the view of the government that is... Um, you have to explain your considerations so the public know, okay, all those who sign the instrument must also show the liability. Well, then that would be a fair way of uh, legislating. There mustn't be ambiguity in legislation, as we know. But in this case, uh, say there is the buyer and the seller in the transaction, that means, of course, uh, Buyers and sellers have to take up the um, responsibility for paying stamp duty. But how come that uh, responsibility also extends to others who sign the instrument? Has it traditionally been a case or uh, is it a case only in special circumstances? Now, for many such instruments, very often people just copy the template. That is, you, you copy from previous uh, version, and then you just change the, the, the title, so uh, you change the subject matter, and then it becomes the um, text of the legal instrument, um, especially if it's the case involving minor amendments. It's often done. But perhaps under uh, another circumstance, such minor amendments could lead to serious problems. That's why... In the course of legislation, we have to ask the explanation how we should interpret the amendments. With regards to Mr. James Toe's amendments, the Democratic Party feels that so long as the bill is clear and there won't be any wrong messages, for example, um, misleading the market into thinking that the government is cutting back on the curves, then um, the government's amendments would be accepted. If the pro-establishment camp feels that the government's views should be supported, we should have a debate. When you look at the report of the Bills Committee, there was um, no discussion and there was no response from the government. So um, the matter wasn't looked at from different perspectives. And all the government said was um, talking about general scenarios. I think this is not enough to convince the legislators who are all very intelligent. The pro-Beijing camp um, should not cite the Secretary's words as the sole justification, or else we cannot play our function of gatekeeper and scrutinizing bills. If we do not tackle this issue heads on, we are not discharging our duties. I think the pro establishment camp should offer a response on this instead of just casting a vote against Mr. Toh's amendments. I realize that Mr. Holden Chow has a lot of interest in this bill, and um, we agree with some of your amendments because they would help cut administrative costs. 
the pro-democracy camp is likely to support your amendments. However, if we have doubts on this bill, I hope Mr. Chow can give us a hand in um, clarifying the matter with the government. Would there be um, other perspectives offered by the government or offered by you on behalf of the government? So that way we can have a more complete hands out which would offer more justification. I think the government's response is most important and it would go on record. So um, if we have cases in the future that would um, constitute legislative support. So um, I hope the government would offer a response. I think um, their claims of um, with regards to general situations would not be acceptable. Mr. Kent Lung, Chairman. On Mr. Toh's amendment on Section 4, brackets 3, I have um, certain views. As I said already, I do not support the amendment. A number of members from the um, pro-democracy can explain why they support the amendment, and there are three reasons I would not support the amendment. First of all, the um, spirit of the ru rule of law means that everyone is equal. Why should estate agents ex enjoy exemption from a flat rate of 15% for brokers who work equally hard? They are also um, affected by Section 4, brackets 3, but why aren't they enjoying the exemption? This is about impartiality. And secondly, I'm very disappointed at the government's response to queries from members. The stamp duty bill has had a very long history and it was derived by a compar derived from a comparable stamp duty ordinance in the UK. But that is not saying that nothing has to be changed. But as for Section 4, brackets 3, on the use of instruments. The government simply said this is to um, safeguard our tax revenue, but the issue is not as simple as that. The word use, well, um, if the government fails to receive revenue in a trans transaction from um, either buyer or seller. The instruments would be adduced as evidence, and if the government wants to recover um, the fees or, or commission from the buyer or seller, since the um, Estate agents have used the um, instrument. The um, government might need to um, impose stamp duty, but this is not the spirit of the matter. Under the SDO, if no um, stamp duty is paid on um, an instrument, then um, or a chargeable ins instrument. Then um, it would, it might become part of the evidence. But in criminal procedures, the instrument could be adduced as evidence. So um, this is very clear from the ordinance. So um, if a chargeable instrument is not produced. Well, the, um, the the judge has to use the instrument as well. Doesn't mean that the judge has to pay stamp duty. 
So I think an amendment is unnecessary and um, the government's explanation was incomplete. Within a common law jurisdiction, we have certain customs and um, we have a legislative process. We also have equity law. You talked about a general scenario. Even if the buyer or seller does not pay the um, stamp duty, if the estate agent performs a transaction on behalf of a buyer or seller, and if the, the estate agent's account holds, let's say, five or six million of the um, buyer's money, this is not the um, asset of the agent. They are simply managing the cash or assets on behalf of the buyer or seller. The court would then consider who the money belongs to and they would also um, consider other factors before they seek to recover the stamp duty to from the buyer or seller. In other jurisdictions, including the UK, I have not seen I have not seen any precedents in which um, due to a failure to collect the um, two percent duty, the use of an instrument would lead to um, recovery. from the belt buyer or, or, or seller. The um, relevant ordinance in the UK has a history of more than 150 years, so this should not be um, how the provision is interpreted or applied, and the government should not have given the um, answer they did. I think um, the matter is very clear. Apart from the ordinance, the the court would also apply the principle of equity. So um, let's not make things more complicated than necessary. So I hope um, you understand my justifications. Thank you, Mr. Leng Yuchong. Chairman, a number of members talked about the um, tax rate of fifteen or duty rate of fifteen percent in part three or of the third group of Mr. Toh's amendments. As for the exchange of properties and the um, statutory time limit, I have something to say. But before I enter the discussion proper, as other members have suggested, I hope you would allow us to um, share our overall views on stamp duty. As you know, in the previous term, administration property prices continue to rise substantially. And um, as properties became more and more Inaffordable for the public. Apparently, um, the government had no um, countermeasures, and um, as you know, one of the um, measures would be to increase land supply. But the government told us consistently that they could not find land, and um, they did not know what to do. So, um, in this context, they introduce the stamp duty as an answer to the issue. So um, at that time, the government did sell land 
but um, it only um, further stimulated property prices, and um, at the end, the um, land prices remain high, and the property prices actually increase instead of decrease. So um, the government had been thinking about how they can deal with the um, negative sentiments, and um, they decided to introduce the um, DSD. So um, th they resorted to administrative measures. So um, DSD would be payable on the um, sale and purchase of properties, and um, the money would um, be paid to solicitors before being returned to the government after the ordinance was passed. At that time, the government expected to achieve a result. In the past year or so, has the DSD been effective? Of course, um, we would not know what would happen if we did not have such measure. But in the past year or two, we saw that property prices did not drop because of the DSD, and um, the prices only continue to rise. So um, we have seen, con we have constantly seen uh, very expensive properties, and um, they um, the prices have hit new highs every year. Even if today we support all the amendments. We are not going to achieve the effect of suppressing property prices. There is no way we can do that. Therefore, you should not be complacent, the administration. I don't think you will be complacent thinking that by having DSD, you will be able to tackle the high property price problem because you're not going to be able to do it. When we discuss this issue, members are saying that you should make recourse to other measures in order to tackle property price problems in Hong Kong. Say, for example, whether you can resort to, say, a vacancy tax, or you can convert industrial buildings into singleton units. You should resort to different channels in order to provide housing to the public so that property prices might ease off in a certain way. However, we cannot see the administration reacting proactively in all these aspects. On the other hand, it seems you are waiting for something to happen, though we don't know what you are waiting for. Today, of course, I think the bill will be supported, but after that, can you come up with more effective measures? Can you listen to recommendations from the community so you can provide housing to the public? Taking the last term and this term of the government together, you have said that this is the most central issue you have to deal, deal with. Coming back to Mr. James Toes and Mr. Holden Chow's amendment with regard to the time limit for disposing the original property, the administration is saying that this should be done within six months. The problem is members are proposing nine months or 12 months. Now, what is the difference between six months and nine months or 12 months? The difference is just a few months. Why are members moving these amendments? And why do members support those? It is very simple. When the public need to dispose the original property, they need time to deal with certain issues. For example, price bargaining, selling the property after refurbishment, all these take time. And perhaps six months is not enough to deal with these issues. Whether it's six months, nine months, or 12 months, it just means that more opportunities can be given to the public to buy and sell property. Well, I don't know whether this will bring about 
any positive effect. We don't know yet, but if we can do that, we hope we can do something. So it is not an, any kind of uh, philosophy or any kind of scientific decision that one is definitely better than the other. It is just that if the period is longer, there is a, um, a better opportunity. It's as simple as that. Therefore, on this point, uh, this is what we want to do and we hope to bring about a positive effect in terms of property supply. This is the main reason we support the amendment. I still believe that this will not be the solution for tackling the huge demand on housing. Even if we adopt this amendment, even if it is passed, what will happen? Will we be able to solve the problem? No, I don't think so. As I said, we hope that at this stage, the administration can think of other ways to tackle the problem. The administration is saying that it is looking for land all the time. Uh, bureaus and departments are saying that they are thinking of different ways and means to look for land. Yes, land supply is a long-term solution and it is the right direction to tackle housing supply problems, but believe there should be other short-term and medium-term measures. This bill is in front of us. It It is a short-term measure, let's say. What about the medium-term? I hope you will listen to the public. Recently, in the housing panel, I said again that you should consider imposing rent control. So tenants will have their burden relieved somewhat. The burden is brought about by spiraling rental. Now, I don't know whether the officials own their own property, so you may not understand the pressure brought about by rental. But for grassroots, they may not be in public housing, and they may be in the queue in the waiting list, and they have to rent property. They are under pressure, and you must help them relieve that pressure. The administration has said time and again that According to what the last term of government did, the administration is saying that rent control will not bring about any positive effect, and that's it. And you are not giving it further consideration. But is that the case? Let me repeat my point. This may not be in direct relationship to this bill precedent, but since the bill, even if adopted, will not be able to tackle the problem in the medium term, I would want the administration to review the rent control policy again. In our history, there have been two times when we had rent control. Since we had it two times, why don't we now revisit what kind of effect it can bring about? If it had had no effect, it could it would not have been with us for two times in the past. So I hope the administration will really consider taking medium-term measures to tackle the housing supply problem. Mr. Chairman, while we scrutinize this bill, we would want the administration to understand one point, and that is this NRSD or DSD, well, this is a demand-side measure. You want to suppress property prices, but as I said, we could see that it doesn't really have any effect in reality, and therefore you should work on other fronts and take other measures uh, so you can tackle the problem. This is what is important. Of course, I hope the bill will be supported as soon as possible, or else the administration will say, since we still have the bill, we should not turn our attention to other things and it is not, uh, they will not be in a position to do other things. So after the bill is adopted, 
I hope that after you have dealt with this, you will give serious consideration to working in other directions and taking other measures to relieve the pressure of property ownership. So I speak, Chairman. Mr. Ray Chan. Mr. Chairman, can I please ask for a call for quorum first?
陈志全议。Mr. Ray Chan, thank you, President,、uh, Mr. Chairman. Now I will continue to explain why I support. The amendments of two members to extend the、uh, exemption period from six months to nine months or twelve months. Now, but first of all, I'd like to respond to the points made by some members who just spoke before me because I couldn't agree with them. Now, Mr. Lang Yu Chong,、uh, they didn't say anything particularly controversial, but I could not agree to a sentence he said. He said he hoped that、uh, this. Um, stamp duty amendment number two, Bill Twenty Seventy, should be passed as soon as possible. Now, I was, I said that originally. The government said that originally. Now, when、um, the government resumed the second reading debate of this bill, that's what the government said too. You could go back to the、uh, remarks of the secretary. That is, he asked members to pass the、um, stamp duty amendment number two, Bill Twenty Seventeen, as soon as possible. But Then he made use of rules of procedure to halt the debate on this bill, and then he said something else. He didn't say that. He said let's deal with the co-location first before, and the rules of procedures amendment first、uh, before we deal with this bill. So he said something else. So it's up to government officials as to what they say. Now you said that this bill should be passed as soon as possible,、uh, so there will be certainty in the market. Now you said originally you want to build the process as soon as possible、uh, to allow certainty in the market, but then you changed your position. So I don't think、uh, Liang Yuchong should、uh, follow what the government said that、uh, the bill should be passed as soon as possible. Otherwise, it may cause uh, uh, send out uncert uh, message uh, uh, confusing messages to the market. But maybe because、um, of this uncertainty, maybe the harsh measures will work better. So people will try to、um, sell their property as soon as possible instead of holding back. So I、um, so I just speak、um, or make my points if I have to.、Uh, I shouldn't,、uh, um, and I wouldn't、um, digress. But you are actually digressing. Yes. Because we are now in a committee stage, and we're talking about the third group of amendments, so we shouldn't go back to what was said yesterday. So can you come back to this group of amendments? Okay, I'll come back to the third group of amendments、uh, moved by Mr. James Toll. It is about um, uh, relieving SA agents' liability to pay the new AVD. The NABD. Now,、um, Mr. Abraham Shek supported Mr. James Toll. Then Mr. Kenneth Leung opposed that.、Uh, in the first round of Mr. Kenneth Leung's speech, I、uh, missed this part out. I didn't know that he was against Mr. James Toll's amendment. But then、uh, he spoke just now again, fortunately. So I'm going to respond to what he said just now. Now, government officials said. That、uh, in response to Mr. James Toll's third group of amendment about um, um, relieving estate agents of the liability of、uh, NRSD payment, now he he said、um, usually for parties executing the temporary sales and、uh, provisional agreement for sales and purchase, it would not be regarded as evidence、uh, for the liability to pay、uh, NRSD. But then in、uh, paper number. One one nine slash sixteen seventeen bracket o two is not what's said. There are two paragraphs in this paper on this. For paragraph eight, it says that um for head one and head one one a for all parties involved um in. Uh, uh, and for all parties executing the provisional、uh, agreement for sale and purchase, they are liable for sub duty payment, and there's no change in this amendment in this amendment bill. Now, for uh, but generally speaking, for estate agents、uh, executing the provisional S and P agreement,、uh, they are not usually regarded as liable for pay. The NRSD. But then, in another paragraph, it said that、uh, for any parties、um, executing 
the uh, a, a legal instrument is liable for NRSD payment. So if um, as the agent wants to use provisional agreement for sale and purchase as evidence for per recovering agent commission from the buyer or seller, then they may be liable for the payment of stamp duty. That's in paragraph 45 of the report, the uh, Bills Committee report. But, well, however, the administration gathers from the market and in general estate agents will separately enter into an estate agency agreement with their clients on provision of services and relevant commission. So officials are referring to the general situation. But now we are considering the merits or otherwise of a member's amendment. Mr. James Toe, your worries is not going to materialize in most cases, that's what's being said. Or if you're worried that it might happen, there are other ways to deal with that. My understanding of this paragraph is that uh, if the buy and seller default in their stamp duty payment, and then the estate agent wants to use the provisional agreement for sale and purchase as evidence to recover uh, agent commission, and the agent must pay the stamp duty on behalf of the two parties, and that's preposterous, of course, as some members pointed out just now. The administration made no mention of this liability, and that's why Mr. James So has moved this amendment. Now, a estate agent won't. There's no reason why S agent have to pay um fifteen percent stamp duty just to recover one percent uh, Asian commission. So you're effectively telling them not to recover their age commission. But then um Pendulum said it's because other parts uh, have not been amended so uh, but the administration is saying that it cannot support this for bureaucratic reasons. Now um, Mr. Kenneth Leung has every potential to become an official or head of the um, bureau because he's got the government mindset. So you bring A here, I'll, t I'll tell you A is not right, so you must amend it. But then the government saying that no, we have to be is uh, equity principle. So B, C, D, E, them um, all say the same, so we can't change A. Therefore. So we, uh, uh, when we suggest, we often do that in both committees, say, okay, uh, the way this is worded is not why we should change it. And then the government say, but it's worded the same way in many other pieces of legislation, so they won't change it. So uh, you bring A over and we find a problem, let's, let's change A. Don't talk about proportionality. And then maybe you should also study whether B, C, D, E should be amended too. Otherwise, there's n you won't need to change anything at all. Because um, next time you bring A, a B, and we want you to change it, you say, oh, last time we didn't change A, so um, f on um, equity principle, then we shouldn't change anything again. So nothing will ever get changed. I don't know if um, Mr. Kenneth Leung has been brainwashed by the government. He seemed to be saying something similar. It's, it's saying that um, this um, amendment is... Um, for improving upon this bill, but it won't be fair to other bills, uh, legislation without similar amendments. So in that case, we shouldn't change it. No, how can that be? And Mr. Kenneth Leung also made another mistake. He also criticized the government, or he criticized this amendment of Mr. James Toe. Now he's saying that Mr. James Toe some concern is undue, is unwarranted, and and he says that um, the um, provisional SMP agreement could be is admissible as evidence in court. Now, um, estate agent will not pay fifty percent of stamp duty just to recover a one percent commission. So, is there any way you can help agents uh, recover their commission then? Let's say, uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say there is this mainland um, um, man who's very rich. Uh, he buys uh, 10 properties uh, and he has to pay $30 million in stamp duty. And all SJ agents, of course, try to get his business. 
even if he says he won't sign. This is what the, uh, uh, this agreement the government mentions. So he therefore gets to pick an agent, and agents who won't make him sign um, commission contract, an uh, uh, agency agreement uh, would get a business. But uh, for whatever reason, somehow this uh, uh, mainland tycoon um, becomes broke. He may even be jailed uh, or whatever. And then he's not paying stamp duty. He's not paying agent commission. So if the agent then wants to recover the commission, he has to produce the provisional agreement for chair and purchase to prove that he's uh, helped to facilitate the completion of this uh, transaction. But then the government is saying that the agent must uh, pay for the $30 million of uh, stamp duty or, or at least uh, recover it on for the government. But how is the agent going to do so? So I think um, we have to consider this concern raised by Mr. James Toe. Now, Mr. Kenneth Learn referred to the principle of fairness, or he thinks that um, this um, move is unwarranted. Mm, no, that's not enough to convince me that there's no need for this amendment. Now, I didn't get a chance to ask Mr. Holden Chow in private. Uh, for the third group of amendments moved by Mr. James, so I don't know what's the um, position of the loyalists. Uh, I heard that they're going to abstain from voting. I don't know what that means. Uh, Mr. Abraham Shack, you are going to vote in favour of this group of amendments, right? Mr. Chow, you can um, offer your views on Mr. Toh's third group of comments, and I will see if you can convince me. Chairman. I would like to talk on um, speak in support of extension of the statutory time limit for the exchange of properties. I support Mr. Toh's and Mr. Chow's amendments because the government's justifications have not been adequate. And um, I'd like to cite an example. In 2014, the government told us that um, the reason for setting a six-month limit was that um, in 2011 to 12. The sale of other properties after acquiring a new property, and um, with among the buyers with Hong Kong identity cards, about half of them completed the disposal of their original property after the transaction, and that was what the government said in 2014 on the situation 2011 to 12, and um, in July 2017, Frank Chan, the secretary, said that more than. 90% of buyers exchanging properties could successfully exchange their properties within three months. In other words, six months were more than enough. If you ask me, even if 90% of the people managed to exchange properties within three months for the remaining 10% of buyers, unless some um, they intentionally do so, you must not ignore their needs. For the figures quoted by the government, if we compare them side by side, the um, pace of um, disposing of original flats are even higher than um, or faster than 2011 to 12. In 2017, you said. 90% of the buyers managed to exchange properties within three months, but was it really reflective of the market? If you were justified, then um, uh, apparently members' views that it's getting harder and harder to buy properties, and um, such claims would not be valid. Let's compare the two sets of facts. I think um, it wasn't so sim uh, so straightforward. In 2011 to 12. The um, number of second-hand residential transactions um, were about 7,000 and 60,000, respectively. And then in 2016, the figures, uh, the figure was about 37,000 transactions, and the um, transactions plummeted by half. So how can you say that um, buyers could get rid of their original properties more properly? 
Uh, so uh, this is a um, uh, adult. The government introduced a six-month time limit, and they constantly lowered the um, mortgage ratio. And as such, buyers did not believe that they could get rid of their properties within six months. So um, they gave up on their plans to exchange properties to seek better living quality. And um, they would only act if they are confident that they can dispose of their properties within six months. Mr. Oden Chow. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not going to talk about the extension of the um, statutory time limit from six months to 12. Because I believe that um, I share similar views with Mr. To and the um, pro democracy camp on the extension. So um, I'd like to focus on Mr. To's third group of amendments. And that is the um, proposal to exempt estate agents from paying the NRSD. As I said in my opening speech, I'd like to thank Mr. To for offering valuable views in the Bills Committee, and this is clear for all to see. Mr. Wu Chi Wai said that um, I'm very interested in this bill and um, sh he would like to hear my views. So um, I'd like a discussion on this. Mr. To would like to exempt estate agents from such liability, and I understand that he has good intentions. But um, there are um, things we should pay special attention to. In terms of stamp duty, it is not only about property transactions, and um, it also applies to equity transactions. If we exempt estate agents from their liability to pay stamp duty. Um, when we talk about equity transactions in the um, securities and futures field, what are we going to do? I've been following what Mr. Ray Chen said. If we are to deal with this, I think we should tackle the um, securities and futures field as well. As the government said, um, this change would not only affect estate agents. So um, if we have a proper review, we should also consider the securities and futures field because stamp duty does not just apply to residential property transactions. I've also been following what Mr. Kent Leung said. So um, for the watching audience, I'd like to say that not everyone is very familiar with our legal system, and um, we have a common law jurisdiction. And uh, Mr. Kent Leung talked about the word equity under the UK common law system. Um, that refers to the equity law. And in early times, some laws might lead to um, injustice even when they were applied. So in the history of UK's common law jurisdiction, um, there was the concept of equity. Chairman, 
from what Mr. Ken Leung said. Some members cited some examples. For example, let's say a very rich mainland tycoon um, completed a property transaction with the help of an agent, but um, apparently um, he he ran he he ran away. And the ILD would say that um, based on the provisions, they can hold the estate agent liable. So that is the apparent interpretation. But um, in a court setting, I think um, the law of equity would have a role to play. The estate agent um, would like to um, use this instrument and recover the um, commission due, but the court might rule that the estate agent is held liable for the um, unpaid stamp duty. If this is the case, that might be against the law of equity. If the court makes such ruling, it would be very unfair to the agent. So you can imagine that no agent would want to pay 15 percent of stamp duty just to um, recover one or two percent worth of commission. We talked about the usage of instruments Some members said that um, if some agents want to recover their commission, um, they might be concerned that using the instruments mean that they would be held liable for the stamp duty. So um, I offered my views on the um, law of equity. If I am an agent, If I want to recover one or two percent worth of commission, so um, so um, using an instrument would only um, would would amount to evidence on court. So um, if evidence is um, adduced to the court, the um, agent would only. Be um, justifying their own usage of the um, instrument, and they should not be held liable for the fifteen percent stamp duty. So um, I've been following what Mr. Wu Chi Wai said. He said I'm very interested in the bill, and he would like to hear my views because um, the, he he wants my views to go on the handset. So um, I agree with him. That's why I offered my views. And um, I have stated my views very clearly. If the estate agent has to pay the 15% stamp duty in order to recover 1 or 2% worth of commission, this is unfair. And um, it would not be fair under the law of equity. So um, on Mr. Toh's third group of amendments, I understand he had good intentions, but I do have some reservations, as I've explained. And um, I'm happy to um, take in his views because um, he is a very experienced solicitor, and um, of course sometimes um, Debates between um, lawyers would um, take a very long time. So um, these are my views towards this group of amendments. Mr. Wong Teng Kwong, thank you. I was the chairman of the Bills Committee on Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2017 on the stamp duty or the so called property curbs. Given the um, 
property price hikes, I think the government's measure has been necessary. And um, each piece of law would have its historical context. And um, it is also a double edged sword. So, um, given the context, we have to implement appropriate measures and policies to deal with different issues. In the face of the current property price hikes, properties have become more and more unaffordable. And in this context, I feel that property curves are necessary. In the past, the DAB seldom moved amendments to government bills. But um, over the course of scrutiny of the bill, as chairman of the bills committee, I felt that certain adjustments were necessary. Oh, uh. One of these is about replacing one's original residential property. And the time limit allowed for such doing and also the exemption of paying the 15% NRSD. Indeed, six months is not very reasonable. We are very pragmatic. The administration worries that if it is relaxed, the message sent to the community would be misleading, making people think that the administration is relaxing its measures. But I don't think so. Let us be pragmatic. Let us talk about replacing one's property. First of all, it doesn't place extra requirement on the market in the form of more supply. In other words, people buy one property and they sell off another property. So it's a zero-sum exercise. Secondly, the actual operation. Just think about it. If a member of the public has to buy a new property and has to give up an old property, what will be the process like? You buy the property, you need to decorate it. I think a simple kind of decoration will take you one or two months easily. If you want to do more elaborate decoration, it may take you three to five months. It happens all the time. Okay, after decoration, you move over. Then you can entrust an estate agent to sell your original property. And it is not that tomorrow you will have a buyer. You have to know the prevailing conditions, and it takes time for the original property to be disposed of, and it may take like two, three months. And the six months would be over. If I buy a new property, I move over, and then I entrust the old property with an estate agent, and selling it, and if I'm given only six months to do it, would that actually stand in the way of circulation of property in the market? Now, that is a fact. And we believe we should relax it to nine months or 12 months. Well, in certain circumstances, I think 12 months is even more reasonable. Mr. Holden Chow is asking for a relaxation by proposing an amendment. I think it is a very timely move. Next, I'd like to talk about Mr. James Toe's work in the Bills Committee. He always works very hard. He adopts a very serious attitude towards the scrutiny of bills. That is not uh, something we can debate. And about this stamp duty amendment bill, he has also given 
very well thought out views. And basically, we agree with the main directions. We basically have the same stance and viewpoints. We may differ in some viewpoints, though. And about the estate agents, he thinks that is not reasonable. Sometimes uh, I have come across these actual issues. Usually, when you entrust your property to be sold by an estate agent, of course, they charge you a commission. That is always the case. And sometimes, when we um, execute the provisional agreement for sale and purchase, we would also stake the commission that would go to the estate agent. And that is why the provision now says that all parties and all other persons executing the instrument will be liable for an RSD payment. Sometimes I think that these problems can be solved. You can separate the two agreements. You can have the provisional agreement for sale and purchase, and the estate agents can also enter into an estate agency agreement. So you have two separate agreements, and so you don't need to hold the estate agent liable, even if his signature is in the provision agreement for sale and purchase. Therefore, you can have two agreements. You can have one for the estate agent commission. This will resolve the problem. I'm not really worried about that. Therefore, I'd like to say here that I support Mr. Holden Chow's amendment because his proposal does not require an administrative procedure. It is a simpler way administratively to deal with the problem. Mr. Toh's amendment can be subscribed to by me, but if I compare the two, I think Mr. Holden Chow's amendment is better than Mr. James Toh's. So I speak. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Claudia Mo. Sorry, I thought it was Mr. James Toe's turn first. Originally, I did not really intend to speak about um, the third group of amendment by Mr. James Toe. Basically, I support it. We should apply common sense to the issue. And that um, this might happen even if it is going to be very rare, and that is that the estate agent might be held liable because of a loophole in the provision. But of course, this is not going to happen very easily. But if we are scrutinizing the bill, let us also deal with this. I know the administration will not agree to this. Well, this morning, no, not is not the morning, but. Um, at noon, I was listening to the administration, and it was said that the third group of amendments were such that, uh, as I heard from them, that this just would not happen, that estate agents would not be held liable for the 15% NRSD just because they wanted to secure their 1% commission. And they said that the amendment, therefore, was not necessary. I found that a little strange, and then I also heard Mr. James Toe's explanation. Originally, I, I thought both sides had their points, but if indeed there is any loophole and somehow inadvertently there are certain commercial acts, then why don't we just amend it so as to reassure all parties? I don't intend to speak for long, but then I also heard Mr. Kenneth Leung saying that since we have the common law system in Hong Kong and according to the common law, we should also be mindful about the law of equity. It seems this is getting legalistic. It seems we are arguing about legal 
viewpoints depending on where you stand. Well, I was trying to follow, and then when Mr. Ho Den Chao spoke, he said equity a few times. And then after that, I turned around and I asked Mr. Kenneth Leung, how is equity spelled? And he said, well, it should be equity, the law of equity. I thought there was an other legal term. You confused me because I have not known that word. Either you have equality. I'm not a lawyer. I have no particular inclinations and I have no intention to go into jurisprudence. And then I went on the internet because I was afraid I would have misunderstood Mr. Kenneth Leung because Mr. Kenneth Leung doesn't support Mr. James Toe's proposal to protect the estate agents. He said this is because we should refer to the law of equity, meaning that everything should be fair and right under natural law. I still don't really understand it. Now, please allow me. There is just one sentence. Following the English common law system, comma, equity refers to the body of law. It is not just one ordinance, but it's a body of law. English court of chancery, and which is now administered uh, concurrently, with the common law and what's uh, the, uh, the considered fair and natural, uh, uh, no, fair and right under natural law. Now I understand what it means. If you change it like this, then similar commercial acts involving estate agents should also be included. Now, I don't understand whether this is necessitated by legal practice, and if we don't do that, would that go against the spirit of the rule of law? But if you are talking up to me about equity, meaning uh, fair fairness, you know, there is no absolute fairness or equality in this world. You cannot be equal to your mother. You cannot say to your mother, don't try to say you are in a higher position. Um, you are just like me. Because in any civilized society, there is hierarchy, even in the family. So if you only say everything must be fair and equal, once you argue this, um, when we want to change our laws at all in the future, then it would mean that nothing can be changed. Because if you only hold fast to major principles, but in Hong Kong we have free trade. Hong Kong is the freest economy in the world. We are always in the top three, even if we don't come first. And why do we peg our currency to the US dollar? Well, you can argue about this. How is a free economy free? So when he says that just because of the spirit of the law of equity, he objects to Mr. James Toe's amendment, I can't really agree with him. But of course, I understand this is a kind of um, discussion with regard to jurisprudence. But on the one hand, there is the common law. On the other hand, there is the law of equity, and they are applied concurrently. If this is really against jurisprudence, then his amendment would not have been allowed. If it doesn't make sense, then it would not have been allowed. If it is now placed before us uh, for discussion, then it would mean that there is this loophole. I have heard the administration say that this situation is going to be so rare that it might not even happen. Mr. Wu Chi Wai was not exactly fair. 
he says that the administration did not give any reason while rejecting Mr. James Toe's amendment. Well, it, it, that's not the case. The administration actually said something. It says that Mr. James Toe's worry is unnecessary because the situation that Mr. James Toe's uh, describes is not really going to happen. Now, of course, it's not going to be 100% foolproof because if that was the case, the amendment would not have been allowed. It, it is not uh, nonsensical as saying that the sun would be attacking the earth because Mr. James Toe's amendment does make sense. Therefore, I hope that the uh, administration should speak again and allow Mr. Wu Chi Wai to exactly understand why you object. You say it would be so rare and that when I'm a, a state agent, I sign an agreement and just for the sake of 1% commission and if the risk is to be liable for the 15% NRSD, well, it doesn't make sense when you hear it, right? So it seems it's not going to happen, but we never say never. In Hong Kong, in our courts, you know, law is pure. That's what the judge would say. If it's worded this way in the law, then it's done this way. So we cannot um, be sure that this is not going to happen. Now you say in Hong Kong there's rule of law, fine, I agree, but sometimes things go beyond our imagination. If you talk about rule of law, uh, for example, like the disqualification of six uh, pandemics, I would never have imagined it before. So don't think that it's never going to happen when you cannot be 100% sure I'm inclined towards No, actually, I'm more than inclined towards it. Actually, I will support the third group of amendments moved by Mr. James Toe. Thank you. Mr. James Toe? Mr. Madam Chair, may I respond uh, in one go to all the views expressed by members, whether they're in support of my amendments or not? I think the discussion here was probably more in depth than the one we had at the bills committee, because there, perhaps there was consensus that the bills committee the members were not keen to debate this with me, and the government was not interested either. He just wanted to, you know, get things done. Now, because I've moved uh, these amendments, so I need to explain things clearly. You know, I'm not the kind of person who would just uh, act on a whim. I've, I think things through. For amendments I've proposed at the Bills Committee, if uh, I think there are certain technical problems and, uh, and I'm not convinced, then I won't do it. Now, Mr. Kenneth Leung is a tax expert, of course. He thinks that um, if this um, section is, um, if this clause is amended, then it affects um, many other provisions as well. Because um, uh, once someone's um, signed this instrument, he's liable to pay tax. But if there is an exception here, what about other provisions? Uh, because then it may become unfair. There may be other cases too with this problem. So then they all need to be changed. So he said, yes, uh, uh, there may be some uncertainty here, but then we have the law of equity. So there is a possibility that the judge or he has confidence that uh, if um, the Inland Revenue Department should um, be so outrageous as to pursue the uh, stamp duty from the agent, when the judge will probably interpret the, interpret the legislation to say that the agent is not liable. Now, if I may respond to Mr. Kenneth Leung, because that was his argument, uh, let's say sometimes uh, uh, we would amend a um, piece of legislation, we see a huge problem, and then we may raise it for discussion, and if um, necessary, we may even propose amendments, and that's the established practice. But you might say, um, if we uh, make amendments here, they may be inconsistent elsewhere, inconsistency elsewhere. So, 
for people who are liable to pay tax, uh, maybe then this amendment will lead to a different interpretation uh, in other laws. Now, if the impact is going to be far-reaching, the government will have to say this is the reason why they are opposed to my amendment. But in the written response or the verbal response given to me by the administration, they never included this point of view mentioned by Mr. Kenneth Leung. Now, um, now, the government has a team of hundreds of lawyers. They n did not see it this way. And if they did see it this way, then perhaps at the Booth Committee I would have said, well, in that case, government, can you go back to do a review? And then if necessary, they can change uh, in one, everything in one go, or they may make amendments to some provisions, but not others, depending on the need. Now, actually, even though the, um, Mr. Kenneth Leung did not raise this point at the Booth Committee, I already asked the administration to review it and come back and tell me what the findings are. And they said there's no need to review. They're just saying that, uh, uh, you know, at the very next meeting, they came back and said uh, there's no need for a review. We cannot change this provision. Now, I can see why they they can't amend the provision, because I've been in contact with the Inland Revenue Department uh, for many years. They wouldn't change as much as a word, because they think it's more important to protect uh, tax revenue. And that's always the mindset of the IRD. I, I can see that. That's the mindset of tax collectors. Sometimes uh, we ca catch um, uh, you know, major cr big criminals and put them in jail, not because they have com committed other crimes, but rather because they haven't paid tax. Because, of course, they won't um, not, uh, record the, the pr proceeds from crime. Otherwise, they would be in jail for many years. So that's why I can fully understand what um, the the IRD has in mind in protecting tax revenue, but I think we at the same time we need to look at it uh, in the whole picture. Now, um, maybe before it's just three four percent. Nobody ever bothered. That's why, and uh, probably no one ever had to recover commission this way. But now. We have when we come uh, read this bill, and it so happens I'm still around. Maybe I, I won't be here the next time, but I'm still here. I've um, got years of experience, and I see something wrong with this. That's why I raised it. So it makes perfect sense that I'm moving this amendment because I'm being reasonable here. That's the first point. Second point: if we rely on ec the law of equity to um, make up for the rigidity of um, the common law system. Yes, there are such precedents. Usually, though, with um, taxation laws, one important point is certainty. In other words, in this case, you have to pay tax or you don't have to pay tax. There has to be a certainty. There must not be gray area unless it's unavoidable. Then we may have to issue practice directions. That's what the RD would do. But now we have raised this point, and in the written response, the government said, in no uncertain terms, that uh, if you do this, then you may be liable for stamp duty payment. Uh, paragraph nine of this document. Paper number one one nine, stroke sixteen to seventy of the bills committee. It's not going to happen. Why? Because I'm not going to pay fifteen percent stamp duty just to recover one percent of commission. It won't happen unless, in one case, uh, that, that because there is this danger that is uh, someone doesn't know anything about this. Maybe it's a small claims tribunal case. Just um, say ten of a of, of few tens of thousands of dollars. And so the person took the case to the small claims tribunal, and then he attached this instrument to his writ, and then he's in trouble. But of course, then we will have to pray and hope that the RD won't uh, go 
crazy and um, ch ask the person to pay the 15% stamp duty. But that person may have already become liable because uh, he didn't know about this. He just um, takes the case to the small claims tribunal. He won't even consult a lawyer because it's just a small claims tribunal. And so he attaches the instrument and then puts himself in this danger. And it shouldn't be the case. And also, the law of equity is discretionary. If the judge then says, okay, uh, if the IRD should take this person to court and the judge may say, uh, may exercise discretion to say, I will um, waive the, you of the liability, that's fine. But what if the judge, just, judge chooses not to do so? Well, so it's not fair. Since if we are going to enact legislation, we must first use common law to interpret the, the, the legislation. And if uh, common law is not good enough, then we have to go to the law of equity to waive that person of the tax. Uh, how can we do that? How can we enact legislation leading to that? Isn't that outrageous? When then Mr. Kenneth Lerm might say that uh, what if the judge also used the doc instrument, then would the judge become liable to pay the stamp duty? Now, uh, the judge say he uses instrument in the course of the hearing, and if the IRD then say dares to say that the judge has used this instrument, well, of course that that's ex that's exaggerated possibility, and uh, I, we don't think the government dares to uh, sue the judge like that and make the judge pay the stamp duty. No, I don't think we can. We will uh, buy that, but the estate agent. He uses instrument as evidence in court. So it's the, the two parties using the instrument and present that in court. And I, as a judge, use the document just to, to rule on the case. So if some um, a colleague cited this example, I think that's really exaggeration. It's not possible. But then um, if you say that S A J is not using the instrument, I can't convince myself that he's not using the instrument because he's using it in court to try to recover his aid commission. And I just um, cited one example about agent. I can quote you another example. Now, I don't want uh, us to be here for another two hours debating this. I want to complete this uh, bill here today. But uh, what about a tenant? I have cited this example at the Bill's Committee meeting. Now, you, you said that Canon might not be a party to this instrument. Yes, it's rare. It's more common for an agent to be involved, to be executing the instrument. But what if it's um, an instrument with uh, it's, um, a sale of a property without uh, um, occupancy? That is, um, uh, let's say the um, le the tenancy agreement is attached to the provision sales and purchase agreement to say that um, this tenant is paying rents so much each month. But then maybe uh, people would ask whether you you are ex um, inflating the case, uh, whether you have a tenant. I'm sure Abraham Shek knows about this. Um, let's say the shop, uh, there's a shop space. Um, and, and the rent going, being paid is actually fifty thousand dollar, but maybe the seller tries to tell the buyer the rent is one hundred fifty thousand dollars. That because that could inflate the selling price with a better yield, and um, so maybe the buyer will say, "Well, I want to see the uh, tenancy agreement," and then uh, maybe the the uh, seller would find friend and to to sign this uh, tenancy agreement, attach it to the instrument. Now it is possible. But then there could be other cases. Even tenants of subdivided flats may be asked to execute the instrument. Now, I'm just renting your property and I put my signature here. Then I'm liable to pay 15% stamp duty. How can that be? Aren't we casting the net too wide then? And then you might say, okay, it doesn't make sense. How can that uh, tenant use the instrument? Well, he might. What if? Um, the new owner wants to evict the sitting tenant, and then the tenant may um, then produce the tenancy agreement. And let's say the tenancy agreement is just an oral agreement. Of course, there's no agreement. So therefore, uh, maybe the oral agreement is just in the provisional sale and purchase agreement. Then maybe the tenant has been asked to sign too on the uh, provisional SPA. 
then if I want to sh show, the, uh, don't want to be evicted, I might then produce this provisional SBA to say that, uh, you know, the new owner knows that I'm renting this place and the rent is only $500 per month uh, for this subdivided flat and the new owner has expected, has agreed that um, there's no need to um, produce, um, uh, to, to um, um, prov um, give, give um, a vacant property. And so I use this instrument to try to um, prove that I am a tenant here. Maybe it's a um, $10 million sale price for this unit uh, because this is no building and the person trying to, the, the buyer is buying it um, for, for hoping that there will be redevelopment. But then this tenant will end up having to pay the 50% stamp duty. It cannot be because that person is not at all related to the sale. So this, but this is a possibility. If the um, secretary agrees with what I said and decides to conduct a review, if the um, order of business allows, I am willing to not move my amendments. I think this is about trust. If you, if the government promises a review, I would um, trust that they are being sincere. And um, for the current and previous century, the um, public officers never um, said there would be a review, and um, they are simply not interested in the discussion. That's why I moved some amendments. I'm happy to withdraw my amendments if you promise a review, and I will trust you. You can tell us in writing later on why um, you feel that the um, amendments would no longer be necessary, or you, or that you're willing to narrow the scope of the amendments. Those would be acceptable, but you can ignore the issue altogether. That's how the um, government behaves, and that was what the CY Lung administration did. They refused to um, talk about details, and um, because they they knew they would have enough votes, that was not um, what happened. Um, happened ten or so years ago. Mr. Alcott at that time was not um, like that at all. Mr. Ray Chan. Chairman, call for quorum, please. Please ring the bell.
法定人數已夠，會議繼續。陳志全。We have a quorum. We would resume. Mr. Ray Chan. Thank you. And on Mr. Toh's third group of amendments, we have、um, just had another round of debate, and、um, we all saw that Mr. Toh was very agitated, and he offered、um, a lot of possible scenarios. Some members might think that Mr. Toh、um, is overthinking. But having heard what different members have said, and、um, for this group of amendments, we are dealing with exemption for estate agents in paying stamp duty. Members feel that realistically, estate agents should not be held liable. But due to different reasons, for example, the、um, principle of equity cited by Mr. Kent Leung and、uh, Mr. Oden Chow said there would be、um, wide legal repercussions, and、um, the arrangement would also affect、um, brokers. And now、uh, Mr. To has been very humble in offering to、um, withdraw his amendments on the condition. That the government、um, would not simply say that they want to seek members' endorsement. He offered to withdraw his amendments if the government promises to conduct a review in a sincere manner. Even though、um, a review might be somewhat unlikely, because、um, there are far-reaching. Legal repercussions, and we might have to involve the Law Reform Commission. And Mrs. Ho、um, said that if his wording has not been accurate, the government can refine the wording, and、um, another bill could be、um, drafted in in the future. But the government.、Um, Cannot say、um, there is no need to make any amendments. In comparing the、um, pros and cons of the two groups of amendments by Mr. James Ho and Mr. Ho Dan Chow,、um, I would do the same. At the beginning, the government chose to ignore everyone. Because the government would have、um, incorporated our comments much earlier if they wanted to do so, and um, they um, would have、um, put everything together much earlier. There were instances in which、um, members' motions were passed.、Um, there were instances in which、um, motions from pro-democracy members were passed, and um, we. Um, Have seen that happening, and the the government would not want that to happen. It would be much more straightforward if if the government had incorporated our views early on. But、um, they didn't want to cede any ground, and、um, they would、um, they are partly taking our、uh, amendments on board. And、um, for the pro-establishment camp, some would abstain from voting. I hope the government would explain your stance going forward on these three groups of amendments. In、um, paragraph nine of the paper.、Um, They、um, do have、um, legal liability, but、um, from what the government understands, estate agents would generally、um, execute other agreements with their clients. 
but it does not mean that they are free from legal liability. And uh, Mr. Toh's amendments were not meaningless. He actually had very good intentions. And I'd like to compare Mr. James Toh's and Mr. Holden Child's amendments, which might look similar. For Mr. Holden Child's amendments, and um, he wants to extend the um, statutory time limit for tax for um, stamp duty refund from six months to nine months, and the landlord does not have to do anything. And um, so long as the um, owner disposes of the property within nine to twelve months, they can receive the refund of stamp duty. And um, in Mr. Toad's amendments. An application would be required, so that is the only difference. So, um, which is the better approach? Even um, Mr. To said that um, Mr. Holden's Mr. Holden Child's um, um, approach is more preferable. And um, from the user's perspective, um, um, it would be more convenient if no application is needed. Maybe Mr. James To worries that. If you take away all the powers of the administration, the administration will not budge. But if you need to make an application, and of course he was also worried whether his amendment would be approved by the president because it might affect the powers of the executive-led government and whether there is a charging effect. If you ask me, um, I think that might not be the case. Mr. To says uh, there should be an application and application processing can also cause money to be spent. So when the legal advisor vets the proposed amendments and whether amendments will be approved, it's uh, not always certain. I My analy analysis is if the administration stands firm in its stance, and if we want to lobby the administration, then we should be more modest. We should change the word shall to may. Well, there is not this word, of course. If the property has to be disposed within 12 months, then it must be returned. But if it is the word may, then the administration may exercise its powers to vet the application and even to ask you to provide evidence for that 12 months and whether you have made a profit of 20 percent, 30 percent, whether you actually have not entrusted your property to any estate agent and then they will approve you after looking at all these factors. All this is about political decision whether you want to make it difficult or whether you want to make it most lenient. If you ask me, proposing just a time limit may not be the best way to do it because you continue to say you want to relax it to 12 months and then people may ask you what about 13 months because if you propose six months people will say nine months and then if somebody disposes of the original property after 12 months and one day then these people may stand to lose very much. Madam Deputy, please allow me to um, go broader in my argument. Tough measures, of course, should be as tough as possible. Mr. Abraham Shek says that um, even if you think something is extremely good, uh, there may be a bad side to it somehow. In the future, if you want to implement more tough measures, you may have to think about whether to just impose a time limit of nine months or 12 months, or you would like to provide an escape clause by saying that if there is a force measures and if the uh, property owner proves that he cannot dispose of his original property within the time limit, then you will still return the NRSD to him. Because of time limit, well, I would like to speak about eight forces measures, and I would just list them out. 
First, if there is a fire in the property and you need a long time to refurbish it before selling it, then he cannot sell it within the time limit. Second, if the owner is in a coma because of an accident and he cannot make a decision, then he can't sell it within the time limit. Number three, there is a sudden death of the owner. The buyer has paid the deposit, number four, and in the end he rescinds uh, near the end of the time limit. Then whether it is nine months, 12 months, 13 months, still the transaction is not gone through with. And number five, the estate agent responsible experiences a sudden death or he can't work because of a sudden accident. Number six, um, dealing with the old property, the relevant lawyer commits serious technical um, mistakes and so it is not transacted. Number seven, because of different factors, the new property cannot be taken over and be occupied by the owner, so the owner cannot sell his old property. Number eight. On the last day, there is a typhoon number eight. Well, also, somebody gives me number nine that the S4J is too busy. She can't process it. So in a way, there are all these forces measures. And if we uh, imply, apply more tough measures, but still we should provide escape clauses and not just impose a deadline. I was not a member of the bills committee, but if there is a second chance, I will. Whether or not you have discussed uh, whether we should just imp impose a time limit, but then there are these uh, different forces that are not within our control. This may be my last speech in the committee stage, but lastly, Madam Deputy, I would like to say something. I also said this last time during the end of a committee stage amendment. Those who supported the amendment to ROP say that the committee and the council are two different meetings, but then you also said that if amendments are carried by the committee stage, then the Accountability Bureau Chief will report to the Council in order to endorse the decisions of the committee stage. Yesterday, when we discussed the Supplementary Provisions Bill, okay, I said that I grant that you are right, but still you have to file a report. The Bills Committee submits a report to the House Committee and it has to be in a certain format. There must be a few pages at least. Then I am copying you, Mr. Bureau Chief. You are going to say this. I now make a report to the Legislative Council that the amendments have been supported by the committee stage. I move that the Council endorse the decisions of the committee. If there is just one line from a bills committee submitted to the House Committee, do you think it's a problem? Yesterday, it was just to incorporate one page into the schedule when we discussed the supplementary provisions bill yesterday. But today, there has been such a long discussion. Some of the amendments will be passed, some not, and the administration may come up with a new stance. We will not be able to see the report. The report will only be in the script. The Secretary for Transport and Housing will say, I now report to the Council that the Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2017 has been passed by Committee of the whole Council with amendments. I move the motion that this Council adopt the report, and then there will be a vote taken. This is too much. If you tell me the Committee and the Council are two things, it's just incidental, coincidental that we have the same membership and the venue is also the same, and by submitting a report, you can resolve the problem. Please, let us adjourn the meeting, and then you come up with a report of like three, five pages at least, and submit it to the council for endorsement before we go into third reading. That may be more reasonable, so I speak. Mr. Ray Chan, I allowed you to make that point just now, but I must also point out here that our, according to ROP 58, 18, when all the proceedings upon the bill have been concluded in committee, the council shall resume and the member or the public officer in charge of the bill shall report the bill to the council with or without amendment as the case may be. Members should remember that this is not 
a newly added procedure. That is for a report to be submitted to council. In the past, there was a similar arrangement, and the report was also orally made. And it is not as what you said, Mr. Ray Chan, that it must be made in a written manner. I will not debate with you further. If necessary, uh, I welcome more discussion after the meeting. Mr. Wu Chiwai. Thank you, Madam Deputy. I will be very brief. I heard Mr. Holden Chow's response. I thank him for explaining to me how you um, viewed the general interpretation and you relied on the law of equity. And that is because of the law of equity, the estate agent will not be the one held liable. But I like to say two things. Under the law of equity or in the eyes of members, if you can't find justification for estate agents to be held liable, then why do you want to say that somehow they may be reliable and then you say you would rely on principles in the law of equity so that, um, generally speaking, he will not be held liable? I like to ask the Bureau Secretary to explain to me if he has a chance. In the law, if someone is not implicated, but still you want to include him in the law and he has to resort to other means so that he will not has to take up responsibility, then should this be something we lawmakers should do? What Mr. James Toll said branches from that kind of background because we can't find any reasonable deduction because you talk about all other persons executing the instrument. Now, according to another paragraph of the report, as Mr. Ray Chan read out uh, from para 9, you say maybe the estate agent may have to rely on this instrument to claim his commission and he may have to take up certain consequential responsibility. But does it mean you want to write this into the law that the parties and all other persons executing the instrument should be held liable? And here we are talking about estate agents. But then other persons executing may involve witnesses. And what responsibilities are there for these people? What are they going to possibly face. If they are unrelated, then why do you want to include them? I will be brief, but I think um, this is an interesting point, Secretary. And after listening to Mr. Holden Chow, I think that members should really seriously consider supporting Mr. James Toe. Because uh, what you are telling me is that there is actually no difference whether this is there or not. And if it is there, you have to rely on the law of equity. But if that's the case, why write it in? And in fact, Mr. James Toe's amendment is not in contradiction to the purpose of the bill. You have to uh, remember this. Now, of course, if there is uh, a different message to be sent, making people think that the administration is watering down the measures, then of course we have to think about it. And if you say that the message is for people to think that there will be more tough measures, that is not the case either. So even if you look at the mechanism, the effect and the effectiveness of the bill will not be affected by Mr. Toh's Amendment. I will speak for just three odd minutes, but I think the Bureau Secretary should detail the explanation to the public. And that is why, and, and that is, why is it that in the process there are all these other persons executing? And we have to look at this from different angles. And also, uh, Mr. Holden Chow's consideration of the law of equity and Mr. James Toe's consideration of daily general operation. And in fact, we can't see why estate agents would become liable in any way, but still you want to write it in. Therefore, I want to ask you, why is it that you don't go for the simplest kind of drafting with certainty? Why do we want to include totally unrelated matters? I would like to learn from you. Please uh, let me have the answer. Thank you. Madam Deputy, does any other member wish to speak? 
If not, Mr. Holden Chow, would you like to speak again? Jenny. Madam Chair, well, taking the opportunity of this last round of speech, I just want to point out that um, the amendments I propose would certainly not send out any message that the government is uh, relaxing its harsh measures. I want to make this clear here. Because, uh, as you know very well, my amendments are just that. So, for local buyers, they will have um, ex uh, sam the, uh, um, a transition period of um, more than six months, nine months, hopefully even 12 months. So this will allow them more time to buy another property. And um, also they won't uh, be deterred from you know, change, um, switching to a different property just because they're concerned they won't get the, uh, the refund of the um, NRSD. So um, my amendment is not, definitely not going to send out the message that government is relaxing its harsh measures. So I have to make this very, very clear again. And about this amendment uh, targeting those who are um, um, wanting to buy a different property, uh, this is just to allow more flexibility to those who need to dispose of their first property. And that will help to um, boost activities in the secondary market. That means there will be more supply. So for those uh, for consumers or first-time home buyers, they will have more choices. They don't all have to buy new properties. We just want to um, change that scenario. And um, this amendment about um, helping people switch to different property is actually a family-friendly policy. Now, people um, need to buy a new property probably because they have more children. In other words, a bigger family, so they want a bigger unit, perhaps. So we don't want harsh measures to deter local buyers from buying a different property. We want to facilitate them in doing so. And that's the uh, in original intention of this amendment. That's what we hope to achieve. So we would like to have members' support. Thank you. Secretary for Transport and Housing, do you wish to speak again? Secretary for Transport and Housing. Mr. Chairman, many members talked about um, secondary market. I'd like to um, give a brief response here. You know, the num transaction volume in the second market may be affected by a number of factors. Uh, the um, situation in the first-hand uh, property market, uh, the bargaining strategy of buyers and sellers. There are many factors affecting transactions in the second market, so it's hard to exhaust all such factors. Now. The um, demand side management measures are meant to curb circulation. The government has, uh, an, has um, announced an additional stamp duty measures. This is to curb circulation. The additional stamp duty measures uh, work actually to curb uh, speculation. With uh, fewer speculators uh, in the market, of course, uh, there will be uh, fewer transactions in the secondary market. Now, in the secondary market, um, the transaction was remained at about uh, 40,000 cases. Um, in 2017, it was uh, 43,000 cases. As I said earlier, the government accepts the amendment to extend the period for people to buy a different uh, unit. So the government is not against um, this amendment moved by Mr. James and Mr. Jehoden Chow. And we will leave it to members to decide which amendment to support, and we will certainly enforce the amended uh, provision. Now, the government, uh, but we must stress that uh, the government is not against this amendment, not because we are relaxing the harsh measures. In fact, the government has no intention to relax the harsh measures. We want to maintain these measures, and we want to put in place the new residential stamp duty measures as soon as possible. This is to prevent um, the property 
prices from uh, uh, the property market from becoming even more overheated. Now, I want to stress uh, um, about um, the amendment of um, ex um, the parties executing the instrument being liable for the payment of um, AVD. I must stress that uh, um, the IRD would not regard agents as um, the party liable for stamp duty. The IRD has never pursued agents in the payment of stamp duty, so there is no need to make this amendment. And then in Schedule 1 of the Stamp Duty Ordinance, Mr. To would also like to propose a, an amendment so that uh, all uh, um, to delete and all other persons executing. So uh, apart from buyers and um, sellers, um, no other persons executing instrument are liable for the payment of um, duty, stamp duty. But then he is not um, also making amendments to other provisions in relation to payment of stamp duty, and that would lead to inconsistency in the stamp duty ordinance. That's why we uh, urge members not to support the amendment. Thank you. Mr. James So. I thought I was going to speak just for a few minutes, but having heard the secretary, the very last um, sentence, uh, uh, last few sentences he said about um, not supporting my Group Three amendments, uh, I, I'm really angry now. I want to talk about that first. The government saying, "You, James Toe, is moving this amendment in relation to the special stamp duty. So for estate agent and all other persons executing instrument, they won't be made liable." For the payment. Uh, now, first of all, the tone of the government said this is n unnecessary. Well, at least that's fair if they put it this way. They, as they say it's not n necessary, it's not that I'm doing anything evil or that I'm jeopardizing um, government's tax revenue. At least it, the government's not saying that. Now, so even if the government thinks my amendment is not necessary, I am not um, harming you in any way about this 15% pay. Uh, Stamp duty, but then the government went on to say, even though uh, you are not harming the fifteen percent stamp duty, you're harming us in other ways because you're leading to inconsistency in the law. So the last sentence is an allegation. They, he, the government asked, how come for the other SSDs and other uh, double stamp duty and other demand side measures, how come you don't make the same amendment, so S agent um, won't be held liable for stamp duty payment. Well, this undersecretary has only just joined the government. Of course, Frank Chai is also new in the, to his post. If it's other officials, I would uh, I would uh, not hold back any comments. Why? Because if you've dealt with laws before or, or legislative amendments before, you know what is meant by the scope of amendment. The government uh, deliberately keeps the scope of amendment very narrow. It's deliberate. We've seen this in the past few years. And that's why when we want to move CSAs, the scope is also very narrow. And the government said that therefore it's also narrowing the scope of its own CSAs. For example, we take the, the um, Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2017, for example. Now we said um, uh, maybe you could make this amendment about uh, the single instrument of multiple properties. You could uh, make the amendment one go. Now, at first, the government said that uh, that was a uh, professor Anthony Chung. He said uh, he didn't see that uh, pro to be a problem, but eventually there was so much criticism. The government uh, agreed that it's a need to block the loophole. But they, the government said for the same duty amendment bill 2017, uh, because the scope of the bill is made so narrow by us, so we cannot uh, move amendments to that effect. The president wouldn't uh, allow it. So for this reason, for this reason, I'm not able to move amendments to the provisions relating to double stamp duty or special stamp duty and so on. Because if I were allowed to do so, I would do it. My assistant is um, very detailed. He would have reminded me. But we know this cannot be done. Now, I haven't tried, of course. If I have tried, uh, I would know the answer. But with my experience, um, I know what uh, the president would uh, approve or not approve. If I try, if I would try it, I'm just um, adding to the workload of the secretary. So why would I want to do that? 
So this is a technical limitation, and the government knows it. If the secretary said in his speech, or blamed me in his speech, that uh, my amendment would lead to inconsistency, and if it's his uh, um, administrative officer who drafted the speech for him, then I'm really unhappy because you should know very well, and other government officials should know very well the reason for that. But you know the reason. If I don't refute you today, then the public would be led to think that, well, in that case, why don't you uh, move the other CSAs? You're not um, doing your work properly. That's why people oppose you. No, it's just that I can't do it. So I can't do it. And that's why in my earlier speech I said if the government w would agree to do a complete review, or what I mean by a review, that is if at the end you think it's not right for the middleman to be held liable, that means the estate agent, then you can um, come back for another discussion on what needs to be amended. And if you think uh, there's need to amend all the reference provisions, then you can run bill for on all the miscellaneous amendments, or even with tax uh, laws, if there's need to amend them, you would do it in one go. Now, it's exactly because of this restriction. That's why I asked the government to go back and consider it. And then the government said, no, I, we won't think about it. And that's why I can uh, I move this amendment, but it's only limited to this provision. Now, if the, this council believes that the arrangement is unfair, and then if we move this amendment and uh, if the amendment is passed, then the government will be under pressure to review the other clauses. That's the whole purpose of me doing this, because it's happened before. Uh, uh, one, we, we managed to pass an amendment before, and then we forced the government to make amendments to all the other provisions. So don't blame, um, ask, blame me for not uh, moving amendments to the other provisions. It's, en it's uh, enraging. But of course, this undersecretary is new. He may not be um, familiar with our procedure, so I'm not so angry with him, because I know he just doesn't know it. Now, anyway, maybe I, I should also say something about my amendments uh, compared to those of Mr. Holden Chow. Uh, one is about um, making application, the other is without application. But making application is troublesome. But you have to, you, you want to get a tax refund, so if they apply to get a tax refund, it's still just the same form, really. Additional work, well, yes. Um, Maybe that's a box to say, and you can take that box to say you want an extension. But still, it's, um, uh, you need to make an application one way or the other. Now, Mr. Wong Ting Kwong said that the DAB or, or the loyalists very rarely move amendments to government's pr provisions. True. Now, Mr. Wong Ting Kwong was the chairman of the Bills Committee, and he said, I uh, worked studiously. Yes, it's true. Uh, perhaps sometimes I, uh, he became impatient, but still he um, uh, put up with me because um, there are certain details we need to consider very carefully. And then Mr. Wong said, the DAB rarely moves amendments. It's true. I've never heard Mr. Holden Chow mentioning that he would move to CSA, he just did it all of a sudden without notice. But it's fine. He has the right to do so. That's the right of every member to move amendments without um, notice, uh, uh, advance warning. I remember there was an amendment moved by Mr. Martin Liao too without any advance warning, but it was really brilliant. Uh, it's about a uh, tax law. He wasn't even a member of the Bills Committee, but he just uh, moved the amendment and it was passed. So he was absolutely brilliant. So Mr. Ho Chow, Holden Chow too also did not say a thing, and then all of a sudden he moved this amendment. And then everybody supported it, and the government changed its stance. Fine, it's fine. But, um, you know, if uh, the DAB, I would have thought if the DAB wanted to move this amendment, it should have said so earlier, because that's the convention in the Bills Committee. You can say it's a gentleman's ag agreement even. Or if you say, no, I don't want to do that, fine. Now, why am I saying this? Because let me give you an example. 
let's say I move an amendment or and Mr. Holden Chow moved an amendment and the, both amendments are tabled at the council. And I see this as, uh, or at the bills committee rather. And if I see this amendment of um, Holden Chow, and then I would say, okay, in that case, let's make this an amendment of bills committee. So the amendment would have been moved by Mr. Wang Ting Kwong, and there would be much more pressure on the government. So I could turn this into an amendment moved by the bills committee, and then it could be passed. So we could have considered that if Mr. Holden Ho Chow had um, proposed the amendment of bills committee at the end. And he didn't do so, and uh, my amendment was the only one proposed. And at the time, the uh, pro-establishment camp did not support it, and the government was totally against it at the time. So I couldn't then force other members to turn this into a bills committee amendment, and that's why I ended up moving the amendment myself. Now, you know, in future, we have many such issues which have nothing to do with politics. I just want to remind you, please uh, propose them earlier, uh, because I would just only look at the substance, the content. Now, Mr. Holden Chow all of a sudden moved this amendment, but I think this is what the public wants. If, uh, if, if his amendment is to be voted on first, I'll vote for him. If my amendment is to be voted on first, I'll vote for mine, but the public just want either nine months or ten, 12 months, that's all. But I would like to appeal to the pro establishment colleagues, please don't just move your amendments uh, so late because there is a problem. And um, the problem is that some um, members who have not been following the scrutiny of the bill well, of course, if an opposition or pro democracy member moves and moves an amendment um, it would be strange because apparently um, we are cooperating with the government but um, this is not the truth if there is consensus among different camps we can force the government to make amendments if they refuse the chairman can make amendments so um, this is only normal this um, should be done as early as possible, and we should reach a consensus for the sake of the public, and we should force the government into changes. If the government is undecided, well, even if the um, well, if the vote had taken place a few months ago, even um, Mr. Holden Chow's amendments would not be passed. So. Um, So um, for livelihood issues and um, issues we feel strongly about, there should be consensus across different camps as early as possible. A few months ago, the media asked whether um, I would support the um, amendments, um, even if the government doesn't support Mr. Holden Chow's amendments, um, our debate is not Im important. But the um, the laws will last, and um, the public would suffer from it. So we have to defend people's rights. I would not um, argue which of um, my my amendments or Mr. Holden Chow's are better, but. Um, for the sake of the public, I will support the amendments. Before I put to you the questions on Mr. James Ho's first group of amendments, I wish to remind members that if this group of amendments moved by Mr. James Ho is passed, he may not move his second group of amendments. Also, the secretary may not move his first group of amendments, and Mr. Holden Chow may not move his first and second amendments either. I now put the question to you. That the first group of amendments moved by Mr. James Toe be passed. Will those in favor please raise your hands? Mr. Would you I request a division? The bell will be rung for five minutes.
Ho Chi Minh could. We now proceed to the vote. Please check your votes. Voting is closed. The results are displayed. Members from FC's 28 present, 10 for, none against, 17 abstentions. From the GC's 22 present, 11 for, 11 and 11 abstentions. The question is not agreed by majority, respectively, of um, each of the two groups of members present. I declare the amendments negatived. Ms. Dari Lee. Chairman, I move that in the event of further divisions being claimed in respect of the um, Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2017, the Council shall proceed um, with um, to the division after the division bell has been rung for one minute. I now propose a question to you, and that is said the motion moved by Ms. Starry Lee be passed. Those in favor, please raise your hands. Mr. Ray Chen requests a division. The bell will be rung for five minutes.
開始表決。Will members please proceed to vote? Will members please check the votes? If there are no queries, voting shall now stop and the result will be displayed. From GC's 28 members present, 26 in favor, one objecting, and no abstention. From GC's 22 present, 17 in favor, five in objection. The question is agreed by majority respectively of each of the two groups of members present. I declare the motion passed. I order that if in the event of further divisions being claimed at this meeting in respect of the stamp duty amendment 2017 bill, the council shall proceed forthwith to the division after the bell has been rung for one minute. Mr. James Toe, please move your second group of amendments. I am moving the second group of amendments. With regard to the second part of Mr. James Toe's amendments, I'd like to remind you that if this group of amendments by Mr. James Toe will be passed, the Secretary will not be able to move his first group of amendments, and Mr. Holden Chow will not be able to move his first and second groups of amendments. The question is that the first group of, second group of amendments by Mr. James Toe be passed. Those in favour, those against. Mr. Elvin Young claims a division. The bell will ring for one minute. Will members please proceed to vote? Will members please check the votes? If there are no queries, voting shall now stop and the result will be displayed. From GC's 28 present, 9 in favor, 18 abstain, abstaining. Uh, from GC's 22 present, 11 in favor and 11 abstentions. The question is not agreed by a majority, respectively, of each of the two groups of members who are present. I declare the amendments negatized. Secretary for Transport and Housing, you may move your first group of amendments. Chairman, I move my first group of amendments to amend clauses 5 and 7 as set out in the appendix to the script. I put the question to you that the first group of amendments moved by the Secretary for Transport and Housing be passed. Will those in favour please raise their hands? Those against please raise their hands? I think the question is agreed by a majority of the members present. I declare the amendments passed. Clauses 5 and 7 as amended. I now put the question to you that clauses 5 and 7 as amended stand part of the bill. Will those in favour please raise their hands? Those against, please raise their hands. I think the question is agreed by majority of the members present. I declare the motion passed. Mr. Hoden Chow, you may move your first amendment to read new clause 8A the second time. Chairman, I move my first amendment to read new clause 8A the second time as set out in the appendix to the script, and that is to lengthen six months to 12 months. I propose to you, the question to you, that Honorable Holden Chow's first amendment that new clause 8A be read the second time. Before I put to you the question on the motion for the second reading of the new clause 8A of Holden Chow's first amendment, I wish to remind members that if this motion is passed, and later, the motion for the addition of new clause 8A is also passed. Honorable Holden Chow 
may not move his second amendment. I now put the question to you, that Honourable Holden Charles, Mr. James To, Chairman. I don't understand. I I would just play that I understand if. Six months is extended to nine months. Mr. Holden Chow cannot move his Second Amendment to lengthen six months to twelve months. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. I now put the question to you that Holden Chow's First Amendment, that new clause eight A, be read the second time. Will those in favour please raise their hands? Mr. Holden Chow claims a division. The division bell will ring for one minute. Yes, Mr. Wang Ting Kuang. Chairman, please clarify. Mr. Holden Chow's amendment is to extend six months to 12 months or nine months. We are putting the question to extend six months to 12 months. We are extending it to 12 months. If this is passed, Mr. James To asked, if this is passed, so we cannot vote on the next one and we are voting on one to extend it to 12 months. If 12 months is supported, Mr. Holden Chow's amendment to extend it to nine months may not be moved. Will members please proceed to vote? Will members please check the votes? If there are no queries, voting shall now stop and the result will be displayed. From GC, uh, FCs, 28 present, 26 in favor, 1 abstention. From GCs, 22 present, 19 in favor, 3 abstentions. I think the question is agreed by a majority, respectively, of each of the two groups of members, that is, those returned by functional constituencies and those returned by geographical constituencies through direct elections who are present. I declare the motion passed. New Clause 8A, Honorable Holden Chow. Please move. Mr. Holden Chao, please move your second amendment. Please move. The second reading of new clause 8A. Chairman, I move that new clause 8A be added to the bill. I propose the question to you that new clause 8A be added to the bill. I now put the question to you as stated. Will those in favor please raise their hand? Those against please raise their hands. I think the question is agreed by a majority respectively of each of the two groups of members, that is, those returned by functional constituencies and those returned by geographical constituencies through direct elections who are present. I declare the motion passed. As the motions for the second reading of and the addition of new clause 8A of Honorable Holden Chow's first amendment have been passed by committee of the whole council, he may not move his second amendment. Secretary for Transport and Housing, you may move your second group of amendments. Chairman, I move my second group of amendments to amend clauses 6 and 8 as set out in the appendix to the script. I put the question to you that the second group of amendments moved by the Secretary for Transport and Housing be passed. Will those in favor please raise their hands? Those against please raise their hands. I think the question is agreed by a majority of the members present. I declare the amendments passed. Clauses 8 6 and 8 as amended. I now put the question to you that clauses 6 and 8 as amended stand part of the bill. Will those in favor please raise their hands? Those against, please raise their hands. I think the question is agreed by a majority of the members present. I declare the motion passed. Honorable James Toe, you may move your third group of amendments. Chairman, I move my third group of amendments to amend Clause 10 as set out in the appendix to the script, and that is to exempt estate agents from the liability to pay NRSD. I put the question to you that the third group of amendments moved by Honorable James Toe be passed. Will those in favor please raise their hands? Mr. James Toe claims the division. The bell will ring for one minute.
開始表決。會 members please proceed to vote。Will members please check the votes? If there are no queries, voting shall now stop, and the result will be displayed. From GC's 28 present, seven in favour, one against, 19 abstentions. From GC's 22 present, eight in favour, two against, 12 abstentions. The question is not agreed by a majority, respectively, of each of the two groups of members. That is, those returned by functional constituencies and those returned by geographical constituencies through direct elections who are present. I declare the amendments negatived. I now put the question to you. That clause 10 stands part of the bill. Will those in favour please raise their hands? Those against please raise their hands. I think the question is agreed by majority of the members present. I declare the motion passed. All the proceedings on the stamp duty amendment bill 2017 have been concluded in the committee of the whole council. Council now resumes. Secretary for Transport and Housing. President. I now report to Council that the Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2017 has been passed by Committee of the Whole Council with amendments. I move the motion that this Council adopt the report. I now propose the question to you that the motion moved by the Secretary for Transport and Housing be passed in accordance with Rule 59, Bracket 2 of the Rules of Procedure. The motion shall be voted on forthwith without amendment or debate. I now put. The question to you, as stated, will those in favour please raise their hands? Mr. Ray Chan claims a division. The bell will ring for one minute. Members, if we complete that reading of the bill today, I shall not go to the next item. I will announce that the meeting be adjourned.
Voting begins. Please check your vote. If there is no question, voting is closed. The results are displayed. Members present 50, 48, 4, none against, one abstention. The question is agreed by a majority of the members present. I declare the motion passed. Third reading, stamp duty amendment bill 2017. Section